Welcome to the future. Get ready to explore how spirituality and science will come together in the age of Aquarius. Hosted by JC Nova. Hey everyone. This week we feature the brilliant astrologer Damien Allen. Damien picked up his first astrology book over 30 years ago and expanded his practice and learning with the Astrology Lodge in London and the British Astrological Psychic Society. Now he writes for two of my favorite magazines, Kindred Spirit and Mind, Body, and Spirit. In this episode, Damien breaks down what we can expect in the age of Aquarius. It's a conversation you don't want to miss. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the show today, Damien. Thank you. Thank you, JC. I'm looking forward to it. Yes, I'm excited to talk about what the future holds for us in 2022. I'm curious, how old were you when you first discovered astrology? Well, I was born in 1973 and uh, in the UK, just outside of London. And at that time, there was a huge cultural revolution to do with mind, body, spirit matters, astrology, tarot, spiritualism, meditation. And my parents were fully involved in that cultural revolution. And particularly my mother, actually, she had many books on tarot and the psychic power of plants and astrology books as well. But I remember I was 14 when I picked up my first astrology book, which was a book called Teach Yourself Astrology by an astrologer called Jeff Mayo. And I picked that book up and I read it. And there was something about it that resonated with me, as though I knew a lot of the information that I was reading. I was captivated by it. There was something that really inspired me and actually wanted me to find out more about astrology and you know start that journey it was familiar to me i didn't know then that you know it was it was going to open a door to my future career and then my mother had a friend that came round who was a sort of part-time astrologer and she did my astrology chart that made sense to me because it was all done by hand then that got me investigating into my own chart and then it became an obsession in a way because I didn't have much money then, I would just spend hours and hours in bookstores looking at all the astrology books and rereading them and sort of gaining the information. And any money that I did have, I'd buy an astrology book or two. Since I was 14, it's always been there. It's always in the background, always something that I've gone back to. And it was always there growing up in those late teenage years and early 20s. It's been a real kind of friend for me. But yeah, I remember that first time, that discovery and thinking, I I get this. I don't know why I get this, but I do. So what zodiac sign and rising sign are you? So I'm a Taurus, the bull. My rising sign is Aquarius, which is very apt for an astrologer. Yes, yes. What about your parents? Are there other Taurus... Zodiac signs in your family, or are you all a mixture? This opens up an interesting discussion because families and in work that I've done and continue to do, actually, you have families that have a particular zodiac sign that keeps coming up. And in my case, it's Aquarius. Oh, wow. What an interesting family. Yeah, my father was an Aquarius. I'm a rising Aquarius. Uh, Two of my sons are Aquarius rising, both of them. And in the Northern Hemisphere, you know, Aquarius rising is actually, it's a short assertion sign. So some signs of Zodiac in the Northern Hemisphere have a two hour period when a child can be born, where, you know, like Libra rising is very, very popular in the Northern Hemisphere. But the short assertion signs tend to be Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces, which sometimes means that it's about an hour where a baby can be born with Aquarius rising or Pisces rising. Actually, you get more um, people born in the Southern Hemisphere that are born with Capricorn, Sagittarius, Aquarius and Pisces rising. So Aquarius runs through the family or other planets are in Aquarius that you'll find or other planets will be in a sign that 
dominate in that particular family. And that is the, the journey that that family has to take through that zodiac sign or some of the experiences they're going to have. So an Aquarius is, you know, the aspect of independence, marching to your own drumbeat, being objective, looking at the big picture, humanitarian aspects. You get that quite a lot with families that a zodiac sign comes up quite a bit. So my father was Aquarius son. My mother, she had um, Jupiter in Aquarius. So again, Aquarius aspect comes through. But it morphs in different signs and maybe it'd be a rising sign or a moon sign or a sun sign or the Venus is in there or Jupiter. Yeah. That's really interesting. In my family, we're a family of Virgos. I'm a Virgo. My mom's a Virgo. My grandpa's a Virgo. Her two brothers are Virgos and my son's father is a Virgo. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) So it's a lot of Virgo energy and I'm a Libra rising with... Moon, Venus, and Mercury in Libra. Yeah, it's interesting. I always find patterns with my friends. Like I have certain friends in zodiac signs, and my friends will say, Oh, I'm always attracted to an Aries, or, you know, my arch nemesis might be a Leo. So I find those patterns really fascinating. There's another really fascinating pattern as well. You have obviously the four elements in astrology, which is, you know, the fire, the water, the earth, and the air. And sometimes you'll be lacking in a particular element and that element will externalize itself with the people that you meet. I think that's a kind of a real fascinating when you look at that. If there's an element that's reduced in your chart, in your birth chart, that element will externalize itself with the people that you know. In my chart, I lack water. My wife is a a water sign and my daughter's a water sign. My friend, the longest serving friend, he's a water sign. My mother was a water sign. You know, so all of this comes into play externalized in the relationships that you have. It works with the idea of polarity, particularly the idea that you're, you're opposites. So for a Virgo, the opposite sign is Pisces. So even though you're a Virgo, there's elements of Pisces that are in you or that will be externalized, you know. So one of the very stereotypical kind of Vagonian traits are meticulous, tidy, neat, health conscious, strategic. But you meet some Virgos that are just very cosmic, very, very out there, very disorganized as well. And actually, they're working with the polarity points as well. So if you're a Virgo, you've got elements of Pisces. But it might be that when you're in a a situation or a period in your life where it's difficult or stressful or a little bit of a crisis, you might bring in that polarity point into your life before, and then you'll flick back to your sun sign or your rising sign. So polarity points work quite a lot. And within family dynamics, of course, polarity points. You know, my mum is a Scorpio. I'm a Taurus, polarity points, you know. You get that a lot in families as well. And that's very, very dynamic because you, you're bringing up each other's issues a lot of the time or each other's weaknesses. And with oppositions or polarity points, you can't ignore them. If someone asks me, well, which sun sign is the most popular sun sign of clients that you get? It's Scorpio. Huh, that's interesting. It's Scorpio. Because they have to know. They're curious. They want to they wanna understand the mysteries of life. Absolutely. But I'm a Taurus. It's working on my polarity points. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Polarity points are, are, are really interesting, particularly in family dynamics and relationships. That's fascinating. So who did you study astrology with? Did you do it independently or did you work with an astrologer? In true Aquarian fashion, <laughs> I did it independently. I was going to study with the Faculty of Astrological Studies in the UK when I was about 22. And I decided not to because I didn't want to be shackled by one particular point of astrological view. I went very Uranian, very Aquarian. And then I studied at the Astrology Lodge, which is an organisation in London that is part of the Theosophical Society. 
and they run um, classes on a Monday night. They've been doing that for I think well, over a hundred years now. So I studied with them, and I studied with the British Astrological Psychic Society as well. There was another group that I studied with called Astrology Two Thousand. This was in. 2000, 1999, 2000. And they, they resided in Covent Garden in London. And they were a small group that was studying mundane astrology, which is political astrology, which we'll come on to later. But I'm always studying. I'm always learning. I'm never stood still with my astrology. And that's the greatness about astrology is you're always the eternal student in a way. You're always learning about new techniques. And what's fascinating is that there's there's a discovery of ancient astrological texts, particularly over the last 20 years, that, that's occurring. So we're getting these methods that astrologers in the Hellenistic times would use. And we're just discovering them. There's some great astrologers are writing about them. So we test them out and we research them. Astrology is fascinating because it's changing all the time. And the discovery of ancient texts is fascinating as well as bringing in new concepts into astrology. I took three routes in terms of my astrology training. What magazines do you currently write for? The first magazine is Kindred Spirits magazine. Great magazine. Yeah, thank you. It is. I love that magazine. I, I mean, I've been reading it since it started, which is around about 1992, I think, 91, 92. The old astrologer who did it for many years was Derek Hawkins. And I did some studying with him, actually. He was really good at experiential astrology, so you'd, which is some, some of the forms that I teach in, which is to really embody your astrology chart by putting the astrology signs and the planets on the floor and walking around the birth chart. So I was a real big, big fan of Kindred Spirit, and they do some fascinating articles over the years it's been it's been a real beacon for the alternative not just in terms of astrology but in terms of health as well alternative health different practices it really does cover that mind body spirit genre by luck and synchronicity i became the kindred spirit astrologer i think about eight years ago now what happened with me is that i still do consultations at a bookstore called watkins books which is in the heart of London, in the theatre land of London. And it's the, I think it's, it's the oldest esoteric bookstore in the UK, but might well be in the world because it started in 1901. Wow, that's amazing. And yeah, and it, the history is amazing. And so I'm the astrologer there and I've been doing consultations there for 10 years. The managing director who bought Watkins books in 2010 he also bought Kindred Spirit magazine so he knew of me and unfortunately Derek Hawkins passed so they needed a new astrologer so he asked me and that's how I became the Kindred Spirit astrologer and as well as that he launched a new magazine called Mind Body Spirit magazine which is through Watkins Publishing and again, he approached me about writing an astrology column. We sort of looked at ideas and I said, well, I don't want to do a horoscope kind of column because I do that for kindred spirit. I'd like to do a political astrology column. So looking at the, you know, the cycles of the planets for the Western world. And so that's how that column came about. And again, that was about 10 years ago. So those are two magazines that I write for consistently. Have you written any astrology books or are you offering any courses online that somebody might want to take advantage of? My first astrology book was published in 2012 and it had the lovely Jupiterian title of The Astrological Dynamics of the Universe, <laughs> 1970 to 2020. And it looked at the astrological cycles from 1970 to 2020. So its basis is in more mundane astrology, and it looked at it from a cultural perspective, at the cultural changes that have taken place. Really kind of, it's very big picture, the book. And that was published in 2012. I'm currently writing my second book, which is, is on the planetary spheres, which is the order of the planets 
in terms of speed of them. Yes, I offer online courses. I teach online. I've just finished actually yesterday my courses for this year. So I've got a little break. So I teach astrology intermediate. I also teach tarot as well. And those classes will be starting back up in January. So head to the website for more details (laughs) about that. Yeah. Which is a good segue. We're going to dive into astrology because there's always this big conversation. Some people say astrology is a science. Some people think it's just for entertainment. I'm curious, what is your position on what astrology is? I've got quite a strong position on this one. I think that astrologers in the past have not done themselves particularly good service by saying it's a science. The reason is, is because when you look into the scientific aspects of it, it doesn't come up to scratch. Let me give you another view of it. It's like learning an instrument. So if you're learning the guitar, you have to know the foundations. You have to know how to strum a chord, what a chord is. You have to know those foundations. And once you've done that, you can make your own music. For me, astrology is much more in keeping with an art form. To me, it's a symbolic language. It deals with the archetypes. There's different types of astrology from Vedic astrology, sidereal astrology to tropical astrology, Western astrology, which I do. And in both camps, really, if you're going down the scientific route, you can put yourself in quite a weakened position if with the scientists. There's better words that I think explains it, which perhaps is an intuitive science. There is a mathematical structure to astrology that you have to learn. You have to learn how to construct a birth chart. You have to learn, like a language, certain aspects to it. But then it's working with the symbols, the symbols talking to you. It has that working within the divine. The more that you work with astrology, the more that you are drawing down that energy of that moment that you're with a client. And that's very, very special and very sacred. And it goes beyond science. It goes beyond those structures and those perimeters. You're working for the highest good. And you're working with the symbols. The symbols will talk to you. They will they will grab your attention. They will show you different ways. But you, you can only do that by learning the, the, the fundamentals, the solid foundations upon which it can work from. And the other thing, of course, is that astrology can work in many different ways because there's many different types of astrology. In the States, evolutionary astrology is very, very popular. So is traditional astrology. There's psychological astrology. There's Uranian astrology. You know, there's these different types of astrology. And actually, it's the astrologer working for the highest good that is important because In a way, it doesn't matter the astrology that you're doing as long as you are working in the right way and you recognize you're working in that divine law. If you're doing that, then it will work. There's a historical aspect to this, I think, because when you look back at astrology, it's one of the oldest occupations. (laughs) You know, it really is. But what happened, particularly in the late 19th century and the early 20th century, is that it was outlawed to do predictive astrology. And the rise of psychology started to really sort of take off in the late 19th century and early 20th century. And you had Freud and you had Jung writing their um, their books. And so astrologers tried to saddle up to the, the, the more psychological aspect simply because it was much more accepted by society. And they kind of had to play that card in a way. They couldn't say, you know, I'm a predictive astrologer. And in fact, that only stopped being made legal to be a predictive astrology. I think it was like 1989 that law was passed. It's not that uh, long ago. Wow. Yeah. Is this in the UK or is this? That's in the UK. That's in the UK. Okay. But um, I didn't know that. Yeah. For me, astrology has always felt a little bit on the periphery of society. and And I think that saddling up to the psychological movement or the scientific movement and try to justify it through that has weakened us because I I think it's much more of an art form, actually. And it's a spiritual practice and spirituality cannot be quantified with science, nor can the aspect of love, really, (laughs) and those emotions. So with astrology, if you say 
to me is like an artistic, it's a symbolic language, but it has its roots and its foundations, you know, in a mathematical aspect. I think that astrologers might have an easier time. What do you think are the biggest misconceptions around astrology? I know that some people obviously really believe in it. I do. But other people are very cynical. And I'm just curious, as a professional astrologer, what do you find the biggest misconceptions are? That it's just sun sign astrology. That it's just a 12 signs of zodiac and it's, it's generalized. Uh, is the biggest misconception I tend to find. I think that's a lot better now, actually, with the rise of technology, with astrology. I mean, that that's made huge inroads. And I think it's got a lot better, actually, over the last 10 years. Astrologers in the past have been kind of clumped in, if I can use that word, clumped, in with um, fortune tellers. That's been a bit unfortunate because... Astrology is far more. It's about self-development. It's about taking a look at um, your particular journey and uh, how to navigate yourself through, you know, sometimes difficult times. It's it's a bit like predicting the weather, you know, I always say to clients. You know, I can tell you to go out and it's going to rain and, you know, you better bring your umbrella. But you don't have to bring your umbrella. You can get soaking wet. You might enjoy that. The misconceptions are it's almost quite frivolous. It's there to be as entertainment purposes. And in some ways, you know, I write an astrology column of horoscopes in Kindred Spirit, as I was saying earlier. And for me, that's a good way of of introducing people to astrology, you know. Pop music is a good way of introducing people to music, you know. <laughs> so you need that. You need a way to approach it that's going to be palatable to the general public. And I think in that way, horoscope astrology is really good. Yeah, I think it's certainly been seen as entertainment. And I, it has so much to it. And it's so much deeper than just entertainment purposes. It's interesting because there's a real kind of revolution that's happening with astrology. Age of Aquarius. <laughs> Age of Aquarius, absolutely. And it, it's really interesting how much astrology has gained from technology. Because when I first started doing charts, I had to do them by hand. Drawing them by hand takes some time. And then we saw really kind of in the 90s, 1990s, we saw the rise of astrology computer programs where you could fill out the details and a chart would pop up in front of you and you could get other charts as well, like look at the transits of the day and secondary progressions, solar arcs. Very, very quickly, that really sped up the process of astrology as well. And that had a, such a major impact. It's really interesting. The internet has made a huge impact on astrology. You can reach more people I think people are curious to learn more. Have you found that more people have been attracted to astrology since the pandemic, since they've had more time on their hands? Have you gotten more clients looking to understand the meaning of everything? Well, that's a really interesting question because I often say before the pandemic, so 2019, there was a, a real upsurge in people wanting to find out more. And I think there was a reason for that, because what I sensed at that time pre-pandemic is that people felt that life was just going too quickly. It was becoming too manic. They could not sustain the frequency on an energetic basis of what life was thrown at them. As I went through 2019, I felt, well, something's going to have to give here. And I looked at the Saturn-Pluto conjunction that was going to happen in mid-January with with, a, with the eclipses at the time. And I did a workshop on winter solstice, 21st December 2019. And I had a, about 25 students that I was teaching in person. And I said to them, listen, this is the end of the workshop. I said, listen, everything's going to change in January everything's going to change. Something's going to hit the world like it's never hit before. I actually thought that it would be financial. And in a way, the pandemic has been. And I said, just just take care of yourselves, you know. And of course, that's when, you know, the 
COVID, we became much more conscious of it. And this was becoming a bigger thing. And I, I think that since then, clients, yes, they've had time, but also I think that people are trying to make sense of the world. This is what's really happened with astrology and, and, and the way that it's been accepted, I think, that the that faith and religion in the West has, it's not as prominent as it used to be. And therefore, I do feel that, you know, human beings need faith in some aspect. I think that's an important part of, you know, to do with morals and ethics as well, because the society is not given us what we expect from it. So the whole aspect of having a job for life, you know, the whole aspect about property and having your own property, all of these things that we've been taught that society will provide if you if you do the right thing and if you follow the rules are no longer there. So I think a lot of people are feeling incredibly insecure with society and their placement in it. And they want answers that go beyond the usual of politics and rules and regulations and what i think covid did is it it amplified this need for something that is bigger than just us and bigger than politics and and that can help us to understand the current climate and how we respond to it so what do you think are some of the biggest astrologicals coming up for us socially. So if we're, if we're just talking about the pandemic, you know, you read online, there are certain countries, like for example, Austria, if you're unvaccinated, you're on lockdown, like other countries are implementing that. And I'm just always think from an astrological perspective, what changes socially do you think will be coming up in the next couple of years? Since we're in the age of Aquarius and it's about freedom and independence but there's also all these restrictions being placed upon us. Yeah. So the age of Aquarius has to be supported by other planets to really begin to shine. There's positive about the age of Aquarius, which will come on to later and, and negative. You have to go back to 2008 because when Pluto went into Capricorn, and, you know, Pluto has a, a sort of 250 year cycle through the zodiac signs. So it means the slowest. Now, when it went into Capricorn in 2008, two weeks later, we had the financial crisis of the Lehman Brothers. So that was the first seed of what was about to occur. Capricorn is about governmental institutions. It's about control of society and the rules and regulations uh, that make society work. And Pluto's unearthing all the weaknesses in that and has been since 2008. And of course, when something is unearthed, something is exposed as weakness, the usual response is to try and hold on to it even more and restrict even more. And what's happening is it's be that Pluto is becoming much more tribal. So uh, countries are doing different aspects and different things uh, as according to them. And there's a fear that's coming up. I'm not saying that, um, you know, COVID doesn't exist or anything like that. I'm saying that there is a fear that is overriding everything that means that we cannot sort of see beyond that. You've also got the disruptive planet of Uranus, which is in Taurus now. And I've got a theory if for all those but in astrologers out there listening to this, check where your Uranus is in your chart natally when you were born. Which house is it in? And check where is it transiting in your chart. So it's in Taurus at the moment. So what house does Taurus rule in your natal chart? Because though, if you look at those two houses, there'll be the two areas that this pandemic has disrupted as on an individual basis for you. And Uranus and Taurus is not an easy combination. It's actually very, very difficult because Uranus is a planet that likes to move, break the rules, move very, very quickly. It's quite aggressive. It's unpredictable. Taurus is the complete opposite to that. It doesn't like change. Uranus embraces change. It wants liberation. Taurus wants the same thing again, 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 again. 
So you have a battle of wills between a Taurus and Uranus as well that's taking place. Plus you've got Pluto still in Capricorn. You've also got Neptune in Pisces. Neptune in Pisces, that went in in 2011. And a lot of people say, oh, Neptune in Pisces is in its rulership. Depends if you believe if you're into rulerships on the outer planets. I'm not. I look at the traditional aspect. What I think is Neptune and Pisces, they're very similar because they don't like boundaries. Information is just out there and there's no boundaries. There's nothing stopping it. There's no containment of it. And, you know, Neptune is the great illusion maker. It's the planet that will rule spirituality and getting lost and a dissolving of oneself or one's ideas in neptune it's running riot so we got this information that has that is like smoke and mirrors constantly we don't know if it's truth we don't know what is truth we don't know if this is real and this is this is also making information really difficult it's, it's trying to bake the boundaries of how we communicate so there is a point to it so you've got these these three outer planets that are very in very difficult positions. You know, until they start moving out of those signs, that's when things start to move on. So, you know, Pluto is going to move into Aquarius in 2024. Now, that to me will symbolize what we would expect as the age of Aquarius. That's when those themes really begin to kind of manifest. And let's be honest, we're not sure. No one's absolutely sure when the age of Aquarius started, really. If you ask me, I think it's the year 2000. I think it it works in sync, but you can't be exact. And I think the themes of technology and individuality as well, and the breakdown of families as well is kind of that very much that Aquarian theme, but also social distancing, separateness, which we're seeing is now the planet Saturn, which takes about 29 and a half years to go around the Zodiac, is in Aquarius at the moment. Last time it was in that was in the early 90s, 1991, 92. So again, that's emphasizing that Aquarian aspect of separateness and the rise of technology. So one of the biggest gifts that's happened, which is very Aquarian, I think, over the pandemic, is the rise of talking online, right? meetings online, doing work online, you know, rise of podcasts and webinars and people communicating via video conferencing. This is this is a very Aquarian theme. It's the rise of information, the use of technology, the use of the individual. So 2024 is a bit of a a key, really. Neptune will go into Aries in 2026. And that's going to feel a very different feel. Neptune is all about compassion. I feel in the West, we live at the moment because that 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 Neptune in Pisces in a very feeling-based society at the moment. I feel this. I feel that. You know, I'm sensitive to this. There's that thing about sensitivity really coming through. But interestingly, when Neptune goes into Aries 2026, and it will be there to 2038, we're looking at almost having battles and fighting for our compassion, being aggressive with our compassion, actually putting structure into that Neptune, you know, fighting for spirituality, not at the mercy of the constant waves that were, were metaphorically in with Neptune in Pisces. We're going to be taking a step forward and going, right, this is this is my truth. This is how this is my compassion. We need to do something about that corner of the world with compassion, with conviction, with morals, with ethics. And we're going to fight for it. And this is when you get social movements that will start that will have a bigger impact actually. Because at the moment what's happening, everyone's getting lost in information and smoke and mirrors. And what's happening is we're getting polarity played out because everyone's looking for a truth and creating their own labyrinth, basically getting kind of spun in that labyrinth of Neptune and and going, well, I know the truth. You don't know the truth. And the other person goes, no, I know the truth. And this is what's occurring. This is very Neptune in Pisces, no boundaries. When Neptune goes into Aries, it's different. There's a directness. 
You know, there's a directness that comes in. So how do you think astrologically with where the planets are, will that bring like a green revolution in the UK? And do you think Boris Johnson will win the next election? Well, but Boris Johnson's had a bit of a difficult time as we speak in the UK. <laughs> he's cha- he's very challenged, and that's to do with the UK astrology charts, actually, which is taken from eighteen oh one when we became the United Kingdom. Basically, it's to do with Mars uh, in that chart and the transit in Mars at the moment and the lunar eclipse. I think with the Green Revolution, and that's interesting. I think that will that will really begin when Pluto goes into Aquarius in 2024 here it is aquarius rules electricity pluto rules other forms of getting power now so the idea of electricity becoming the central aspect of the green revolution is going to be huge when pluto goes into aquarius absolutely huge the uranus in taurus and to do with agriculture and particularly where our food comes from you know, this is this is what I've been saying for a few years now. When Uranus went into Taurus a couple of years ago, it's going to be concentrated a lot on food. Where do our where does our food come from? Do we eat within seasons? I'd also said there'd be food shortages, problems, food prices going up. We're experiencing in the UK at the moment, so food is a big, big aspect uh, with Uranus and Taurus and agriculture coming in as a, as an industry to do with food particularly is going to be very, very strong over the next couple of years. But when Pluto goes to Aquarius in 2024, that will be, that will really help the aspect of a much more global green revolution. So we've just got pockets of seeds at the moment, but I feel like there will be cheaper alternatives that will come in. As for um, Boris Johnson winning the next election, I studied his chart uh, as I like to do from time to time. I don't see any problems with him coming up, um, although he's experiencing problems at the moment. To me, it would indicate that he will stand again and win again when they want to call an election. But uh, I don't see him being in politics beyond 2025. What about Biden? Biden's a Scorpio. Do you do you think he'll finish his term? Uh No. It's really interesting with Biden. He's got, at the moment, this lunar eclipse, which is at 27 degrees in Taurus, is right opposite his sun in Scorpio, 27 degrees in Taurus. So eclipses last six months. So from tomorrow, when his eclipse really hits, for the next six months, you'll see issues around Biden start to play out in regard to how he is doing, what's the future of America, what, what's doing. He he might find that actually things get very, very tricky for him. And what's also happening, you've got Uranus also uh, hurtling towards making an opposition to his son in Scorpio that is in the 12th house, which is the house of self-undoing. He's a Sagittarius rising. So the USA chart is... A cancer sun with a Sagittarius rising. So he, he kind of fits in with the kind of the image, but I'd be very surprised if he's this time next year, if he's still the president. Yeah, I feel like there's a lot of changes and it just on a daily basis. And there's so much going on behind the scenes that you don't really know. And, and the way our country is in the United States, like I live in California, but I travel between California and Arizona. And when I go to Arizona, I feel like I'm in a completely different country. It's very, very different. And I've had the opportunity to live overseas. I've lived in London and Stockholm. And so it's very tribal right now in the United States. Whose side are you on? Whose team are you on? There is not this togetherness, which I think is really important that we need to come back together. And I'm not sure, you know, maybe it's going to take a while before that happens. Well, it is. I mean, as I said, you've got the Neptune in Pisces, you've got the the Pluto in Capricorn. The, the, as I said, that tribal aspect is really very, very playing out really strongly. You're, we're working on extreme polarity points at the moment. And you kind of need someone who's going to be able to hold that and look at the big picture of that and actually be quite dynamic with that. And uh, he's not the man to do it. Those Scorpios on an archetypal level do like to kind of um, 
get underneath what's what's the driving force, what's the real motivation of human behaviour and politics. I just feel with him, even he can't keep up with the changes that are occurring. And the mode of politics is going to have to change, particularly when Pluto comes into Aquarius. So instead of it being one person that, you know, is a president or a prime minister, it's going to be much more coming in with a collective way of working with politics. And so I feel like the the old way of working with politics is 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 coming to an end. And what you are experiencing, what we have experienced over the last few years is the, I would say, the mavericks becoming in charge or becoming in positions of authority over the last few years. And what does that say? The mavericks are there to disrupt. Donald Trump was a is a maverick. He sees himself as a maverick. Boris Johnson is a, is a maverick personality. You get the, the these are sort of coming up to the surface. And I think that that's to sort of disrupt and, and change things to a degree that we have to pick up the pieces and go, this doesn't fit anymore, actually. We have to change the way that we govern, the way that we make decisions. It can't be just one person. And I think that's where we're coming through. To me, Joe Biden at the moment is was seen as a pair of safe hands, <laughs> but I don't think that's necessarily the case that's, that's occurring. And therefore, there is a little bit of panic coming in the state's way with regard to him of whether he could actually do the job. Well, I think a lot of people with the transportation bill passed, there was a a clause in there about the IRS being able to have access to more information about what we're spending our money on. That's why there's this, you know, tribal, it's all about personal freedom right now. Yeah, I think all of us are kind of surprised, like, oh, we didn't expect that. So it's it'll be interesting to see on the political landscape who becomes president in the next election. I don't necessarily think that Donald Trump will be reelected, but maybe No, no, his light's gone out. His light's gone out there. There's a lot of new politicians like the new Virginia governor and different people that are coming forward that could be the leader of either the Republican or Democratic Party. So it'll be interesting to see how it plays out. So with all these changes, and we're talking about, you know, how leadership is going to become more collective on a global scale. You know, a lot of people talk about being concerned about China's rise in power. I'm just curious if you see anything astrologically that's positive or maybe challenging coming forward. What, in regards to China? Yeah, I mean, it's far ahead. I think you've got to look to 2040. That's when um, China becoming a, a real prominence as as a domination. But the world will look a very sort of different then. The environment and environmental issues are the thing that's going to kind of be very difficult for us all to cope with, but also a little bit our saviour as well. Because the way that countries are running themselves and, you know, the aspect of power, that very plutonic must have control, is is going to be scuppered by the the environment and the way that environment is biting back. So I think that with with China, I don't see as a, as the dominant force over the next ten years that's sort of been predicted. I certainly don't see that. Because I think the environmental factors are going to be too great that it sort of switches the attention onto that more than, you know, that aspect of wanting complete sort of control and financial dominance. And I think one of the things that is always worth looking at is the last time that Uranus was in Taurus uh, was in the late 1930s. And there was a lot of financial, uh, new forms of how to deal with finance that came about from that because of the Great Depression. And so I think at the moment, new currencies that are starting to dominate, new ways of dealing with finance is certainly occurring. So I think the old view of this particular country has that dominance is not as, I don't think it's going to be as big as we think it is. I think this is much more about not necessarily one country having ownership. It's groups of collective people that are going to be really kind of taking charge in this and and currency is going to be f- too free-flowing for it to be held in one particular country, if that makes sense. 
Yeah, that makes sense. And with crypto and Bitcoin and digital currency, that kind of really changes the dynamics between the haves and the have nots. Going into the age of Aquarius, what does age of Aquarius mean for you? And what do you think people can expect to see over the next five to 10 years, whether it's on a relationship level to education, to how we live on our daily lives, artificial intelligence? Well, I think all of those things, I think that when we're dealing with, it's that godlike powers of coming of clones and and individuality and scientific breakthroughs, the breakdown of family tradition happening here, independence, a separateness, the rise of technology. What does it mean to me? It means ultimately a much more a society that has a basis in equality. This is the positive aspect of it. And I think that we're seeing the sort of the manifestation of that starting to happen. There's a very good aspect to that is that people are seen as individuals. People are respected for individuality. You've always got to look at the polarity sign, which is Leo, uh, which is the opposite to Aquarius, which loves the the individuality and its self-expression, whereas Aquarius tends to be much more humanitarian aspect. I think in some ways that... It gives rise to the ability to be who you want to be and to be able to have a career and and make money and be individual and to do rather well out of that. I think the age of Aquarius is uh, for me that, and this is what we're starting to experience. The negative side of that is it really would become too intellectual, too cerebral with it or too based on the mind. You know, Aquarius is an air sign, uh, so it does... Some of the more difficult traits of Aquarius tend to be detachment of emotions, too much objectivity. But Aquarians, just on an individual level, you know, they like power. They may say, let's get around, let's all hold hands, but they're the ones pulling everyone together to hold hands in a group because they're always dealing with that polarity of the Leo, which is wants to be in charge, you know. So for a lot of us in this sort of new world that is that is opening up, and this is why I think things like astrology and training through technology is really sort of speeding up and going very, very well, is because it's the individual that is coming across. And so, you know, the whole thing about companies and corporations is going to be less so as we go into, um, particularly from, let's say, 2026. 2024 and 2026, those are kind of marked years. I mean, I'm, I'm an optimistic person, just generally. What I feel is that we can get this right. We, If we can get this right, brilliant. Because if we can concentrate the environment and we can not use up the resources of the earth that, like we've been doing, and we can accept people for who they are, then I think fantastic. The thing I'm worried about, I suppose, is that people become too separate, too isolated with this, and that we we create a society that, um, yes, you can do what you want, but within a certain parameters. That's where I see the difficulty. However, because of the planets changing, that Pluto going into Aquarius, that Neptune going to Aries, I don't think we're going to get to that stage. I think as a collective, uh, looking at Neptune Pisces, as a collective, we don't know what's going on. We're all over the place, really. So as soon as, to me, Neptune goes into Aries, I think there will be a greater kind of fight, not in a, a kind of mixed way that it has been, in a much more cohesive, we know which direction we're going in. And of course, generations... They take over. They come into the positions of power. So you have different generations that come in, astrological generations that come in here. The youngsters at the moment, sort of born post-2000, they're a very Aquarian bunch. They had Neptune and in, in Aquarius. So you've got that coming towards you. So I'm optimistic. I think we're in the most difficult time, 2020, 21, and you know the first half of 2022, it's difficult. And then it kind of gets a lot easier. Things start to settle a bit here. That's to do with certain political decisions that are going to be made as well that I think will have a bearing on settling things down. Because at the moment, it is it is very sort of chaotic. 
I think for a lot of people, it, it's been the fear of the unknown. Like you said, you don't know what's true or what isn't true. The only other thing that I think about in Age of Aquarius, and we're talking about maybe people being too isolated, is I think about kids you know, that are in high school or going off to college. Their social interactions are limited. And then even more of us working remote, it's like, how is that going to affect us on a relationship perspective? Well, we just have a small group of people, of friends and family that we associate physically, like we get to see in person, but then the most of our, our relationships are more virtual or on a global basis. Like there's people that I work with that I've worked with for four years that I've never met in person and they live all over the world because of the work that I do remote. I work in the tech industry. I'm just curious from an astrological level, how, how that's, you see that affecting society. I think you've got to look at, firstly, on the education front, when Uranus goes into Gemini, that's when you'll see a revolution in terms of education, how we educate our children. You know, Gemini is a human sign. It, <laughs> it is the first of the human signs that we come into contact with in the astrological wheel. So I think that's hugely important that when that takes place, that's going to have a huge implications for how we teach our children in a human sign the thing about separateness is not going to come into into it gemini wants to communicate as a collective basis it wants to exchange ideas of course i think it will be very different from what we've previously had in the education systems but the education system and this is my own personal opinion does not work Things are moving very, very fast. That there's a rise of technology that is moving things very, very fast. Jobs are going to be changing. Different jobs that haven't even been thought of as going to be in, you know, five, six years going to come about. But yes, Gemini is a human sign, whereas at the moment is bogged down by Uranus and Taurus. Taurus doesn't want to change. Uranus does. So you're getting this friction between the two. When Uranus goes into Gemini in 2026, that's when policies will be made and it will be really looked at about how early education is in, in the Western world and how that can be changed. And I am optimistic about that. That was my last question. Are you optimistic about the age of Aquarius and any final thoughts that you might want to share? When you have um, an age, we come out of the age of Pisces, so it's 2000 years. So <laughs> we're just at the start so there's always a turbulence that's going to happen because you're changing from one strong archetype, which was the Piscean aspect to this now, this Aquarian aspect. So, of course, there's going to be turbulence, you know, at the start. So you would expect that. It's not going to be seamless from one chapter to another. And therefore, I am optimistic because once we settle into this and we start to build this new world, I think it's going to be fantastic. You know, I just hope that we've done it in the right time, particularly with the environmental aspects. I think we have, and I think we are moving as quickly as we can. But I am optimistic. I just think that, yeah, this this turbulence that we're experiencing, it has to happen. Externally, it has to be a bit of a mess so we can go, this doesn't work. We've got to piece this back together. That's how, as human beings, we we do like our familiar aspects. So if it wasn't a complete mess, <laughs> we wouldn't change anything. So it has to be that the old way has to kind of go and we have to find new ways of doing that. And that's the point of Aquarius. So I am very, very optimistic about it. I think that it's a different world and it's going to bring many exciting opportunities. The world is going to look very, very different in 20 years time to what we have now. And it is moving very, very quickly. You know, I can't wait to be a part of that. But at the moment, we're at what I would say crisis point where we realize that things have to change. But the people in power at the moment might not necessarily see it that way they might be holding on to the old traditions the old ways of working and hanging on for dear life you know and of course what happens is that when someone does that or a collective do that things actually get worse before they get better you know and i think that's what's happening at the moment but i am optimistic yeah i'm very hopeful as well for the age of aquarius well, thank you so much for being on the show. It's been a fascinating conversation. Damien, where can the listeners find you if you have a website or if they want to get a reading from you or check out some of your articles? Yep. So my website is demienallen.com. You can 
book uh, reading. You can follow me on my YouTube channel. There's stuff that you can read and stuff like that, free stuff on the website as well. Well, please check out the show notes. We'll have all the links to his website and his YouTube channel. And once again, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You just heard the Age of Aquarius podcast with your host, JC Nova. Remember to subscribe to the show on your favorite streaming platform. Thanks for tuning in. Age of Aquarius is a cosmic media production and recorded in Los Angeles, California. A special thanks to our producers, Georgie Rutherford and Christopher Lang. To learn more about Age of Aquarius, please visit our website at ageofaquarius.fm. Thanks for listening. Yeah.